Okay, well, welcome to the uh, last uh, session of the day. Uh, I'm Don Robinson. I'm one of the uh, contributing editors for Streaming Media Magazine. So uh, you may have uh, read some of the uh, articles and output I've, I've put together, or the opinions or the unqualified judgments that I've made about the industry. Um, my own background, uh, I did my first webcast in uh, 1996 out of the back of the Ministry of Sound here in the UK and printed some business cards professional webcaster. I like to consider myself the longest web, the longest running uh, professional webcaster in the UK, although I'm actually aware that several other people did webcasts just before me. I've been a passionate advocate of streaming uh, for about 12 years, uh, or thereabouts, my math is probably off. Um, and uh, over that time I think I've tried pretty much, I've tried to launch ventures in pretty much every stage of the workflow. Uh, doing everything from field webcasting, producing synchronized slideshows, put, helping BT do the background planning for vision. I built my own CDN for a while, which uh, did very well and then did very badly, and I closed it down and went back to consulting. Uh, and, um, sorry, Tim's laughing in front of me. <laughs> um, and uh, over the years I've seen, uh, I've followed a personal desire to kind of democratize media, make, it, make broadcasting more accessible to people. Um, and part of that journey has definitely involved doing uh, webcasting from places which don't have connectivity. So one of those, uh, one of those places is obviously news events. Unfortunately, uh, trains don't crash at the end of broadband lines and uh, uh, political revolts don't happen at the end of leased lines. So we have to have technologies which enable us uh, more and more to backhaul broadcast contribution feeds from events on an ad hoc basis to, uh, to servers that can then distribute them. So uh, as live streaming has uh, uh, sort of been pivotal for my life, I, 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 I've seen a number of technology changes over the years. Um, typically the festival, the news event, the uh, CEO broadcast, the Glastonbury Festival, the Fat Boy Slim concert, these, these events have happened at places where we need to put some con connectivity in place. And uh, traditionally, for many years, the technologies uh, were outside broadcast vehicles. Uh, TV companies had uh, expensive trucks, which they used to use high bandwidth, uh, expensive uh, SCPC broadcast links to compress video. They bring it back to a data center and compress it at the center of the network. And then probably by about um, 2000, maybe, maybe just before 2000, we were starting to use VSAT and take IP to the edge, which was giving us a different control plane in the field. We could do synchronized multimedia. We could start adding uh, all the functionality you expect on a webcast, uh, which is maybe richer than just a traditional broadcast. Um, and uh, then uh, and, and VSAT costs came down, various uh, SEPC providers decided they could sell four times as much bandwidth over the same link. Uh, and these changes, at one point we had uh, in, in my CDA, we had a, an outside broadcast vehicle, which probably cost about £60,000 at the time to get set up. I think these days, with some of these gentlemen's technologies, you could probably set up a similar contribution feed for about the same price that the seats in the van used to cost. And uh, this is changing the shape of media. Increasingly, we're seeing Twitter being the first technology to break news. Uh, then we see the 3G phones on site. Then we see the live view technologies and the, what I'm terming at the moment in the magazine cellular multiplexes or cell marks is turning, turning up on site using aggregated cellular links and so on. And so today, uh, we could talk very technically or we could talk at a very high level about how the live news workflow is changing. So before, we, before I introduce the speakers, before we dive in and get to either too geeky or too high level, can I just see a show of hands uh, from the audience? Who here would consider themselves primarily uh, interested in this topic with a, a technical or, or an engineering uh, focus? Um, so can I just see a show of hands? The alternative will be a business uh, focus. So let's go for the technical first. Okay, it's probably, probably about half and on a business and high level focus. And who's just, I take it the rest of you are just broadly interested. Okay, so I think I'm going to allow the audience to get geeky uh, 
and binary. Eric was warning me not to go immediately into geekiness without checking. So, um, so uh, let me introduce uh, let me introduce my speakers, or actually, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, we've got a mixture of names, and my pronunciation is not always ideal, so I'd rather they introduce themselves. So, if we could start with Hans, if you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your company and your role in the uh, in the live streaming workflow. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if this sound goes out. I have no idea. Can you hear? No one is saying anything. Uh, well, my name is Hans Eriksson. Uh, I work for a company called Bambooser, um, which is a startup based in Sweden and Finland. And uh, basically what we're doing is that we're offering anyone with a mobile phone or a computer to, to live stream uh, video to anywhere on the internet. Um, and we've been doing this for quite a few years. And over the past, I would say, six to nine months, we start see, we've started seeing a, a huge demand for, for our service. It's, it's a free service that anyone can download. It works on pretty much any phone apart from BlackBerry's. Uh, and there's a, there is a browser-based version as well that you can use. And, and <clears throat> what really took off for us was uh, during the elections in Egypt uh, late last year, where, where human rights activists uh, distributed information on how to use Bambooser in Egypt as a tool to monitor the elections as no, uh, uh, no external uh, observers were allowed into the country. And during just one single day during the election day, we had 10,000 videos coming out for videos only, which is an amazing number. And, and we've been growing from there. Um, and it's a tool you can use from, from that side to uh, any side you like, really, if you're on holidays, if you see something funny, or if you just want to share your things with, with friends and family. So we're basically a consumer play. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing business uh, business to business as well, but, but our play is primarily consumer. So uh, my name is Ariel Galinsky. I am uh, with LiveView. LiveView is known as the company that introduced to the market the uh, satellite track in the backpack concept. Uh, we do not use the satellite uh, uplink, but we use primarily cellular uplink. Uh, and over cellular, we can deliver 1080i HD uh, video quality. Uh, the trick to that is that we take several thin uplinks, and by smartly aggregating them, we create one resilient uh, uplink that can deliver that uh, level of uh, video quality. So we have been in the market for uh, a bit over three years. And uh, I think that by now we serve most of the world's uh, largest uh, media organizations. Uh, we are in over 60 countries. Uh, but uh, no, not only we serve the, the large players, but increasingly uh, we are serving many newspapers and sports organizations and general corporations with a variety of uh, uplink uh, video applications. Just to um, clarify the difference between ourselves and Bambusters, so in the same Egyptian uh, events around the revolution, we, uh, we were used successfully by many of the broadcasters to bring live uh, news, breaking news from Tahrir Square when the revolution was uh, taking place. Uh, in many times actually driving the Egyptian police crazy, they are wondering how the broadcast is coming up when no satellite track was allowed in. Uh, so that's uh, so we are a professional player at this time. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm from Minicaster. Um, the reason why I'm dressed like this is we are exhibiting here and we, let's say, pronounce the encoding, the live encoding rebellion, because uh, it's fashionable to run in these terms. Uh, the product we just recently launched is the Minicaster. This is the product you see here. It's a live H.264 HD encoder. It provides you connectivity to the internet via Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, satellite, or LAN. And uh, you can ingest SDHD signals over SDI or SD signals analog and very soon in HDMI. We think that uh, a device roughly 2,600 euros in the professional version and lower for the other versions is capable to uh, enable everybody's Joe to stream live, so any sports club, funerals, weddings, and so on can be done like this because it's getting so easy. It's just by the push of the button if you have made some settings up front. And um, we believe there will be a strong long tail market for live streaming in the near future. And this is why we developed this product. We are companies called TV One. We're on the market since 1998 with web TV and web streaming. We were waiting for a product like this by the industry and they were not coming up. 
uh, for the price range for that size and mobility. So we did it on our own and uh, since 10 days we are shipping and it looks promising. Thanks. Uh, my name is Andreas Edretting. I'm working for Thomson Reuters, um, professional services company, the markets division. Um, part of the markets division as well is the news agency Reuters, especially for the topic today. Um, yeah, especially having those challenges in the field. And that was probably one of my colleagues over there using LiveView. And um, we always have those challenges, exactly as you described, being somewhere where our first priority is always get safe, has a fresh water source and something to eat. But this, actually the third problem is always getting connectivity back to the office to actually be able to deliver the news. The big challenge is, um, or the market has changed for us dramatically from a text-based news coverage years ago to a picture based and now to a movie base. And everybody, if I'm remembering or what I can remember from the Arab Spring is pretty much the pictures and the, the images, the movies. Barely anybody can recall a headline. And that is especially a news agency. It is key for us to be able to deliver, even if it's shaky, even if it's low quality, the um, resell value as a professional services company, as a news agency, of a moving picture is obviously much higher than it is a fixed picture or even just the message. Okay, so I must just add, I uh, co-opted Andreas to sit on this panel in replace of uh, Lippe Osterhoff, who uh, uh, had to cancel, he had an emergency to go and probably film, I guess, <laughs> if, it's, if it's holding true. So I've uh, co-opted Andreas in at short notice, uh, so uh, special thanks to Andreas for that. So um, uh, thinking about how to approach this, I'm going to start by, uh, by looking at things using the ISI stack. It's always a good model to, to follow and look at the physical technology challenges of getting connectivity first and foremost. So I think obviously, uh, Ariel, your technology uh, allows, uh, allows uh, the, the videographer to, uh, to find, uh, find connectivity where theoretically they otherwise couldn't. Um, what have been the challenges for you getting to the point where, uh, where the technology worked, uh, where cellular networks could carry that data? Yeah, so uh, as you're alluding to, uh, bandwidth is uh, in invisible and uh, we, uh, we always uh, need it in places that, uh, you know, when it's breaking news, it's always challenging. So breaking news can happen in, in suburbs where coverage is not that great. It can happen within fixed building or in, in busy sports events, and those are always very challenging environments for, for the uplink. So um, we specifically went ahead to develop technologies to combat these issues. Uh, two of the main uh, technologies that uh, we develop are related to one is the um, automated load balancing between the different uplinks. So uh, in essence, when you would be using live use, say uh, from this panel if you would want to, uh, the unit at every point in time and location would measure the relative strength of each one of the available wireless connections. And based on that, we'll create the best possible way up for the video. So uh, if we would be in the US, uh, you know, at uh, one moment we would be using um, Verizon more than AT&T, and the next moment it will be uh, the AT&T more than Verizon. And it, it keeps going like that, uh, generating the best possible link. So this is one set of technologies uh, that you know, ensure the, uh, the video quality and resiliency. The other technologies have to do with the passive antenna that we have. It's actually derivative from military technology that we got our hands on. And in essence, what it would uh, enable doing is, uh, say, our regular cell phones would, would uh, see at an, uh, a regular time five to eight, to eight antennas around it our unit would see 20 to 25 antennas. And what that would allow it to do is to actually hop over congested areas to allow uh, the, uh, the transmission. Um, e even with all of that, I must uh, say and, and admit, you know, uh, it, it's the technology um, is not yet where the, uh, the, the satellite uh, technology is. So while we now know that we work in, in most places and uh, you know, we keep growing and people uh, benefit from our technology, we still face challenges. So it's not a commodity as of yet. And do you face challenges with other logistics such as power? Uh, you know, it's, uh, presumably higher power transmission reduces battery life or uh, and so on and so forth. You, you, is that a challenge that you've had to manage? So uh, we, we, we can uh, use the Anton Bauer uh, batteries, or we also offer uh, internal batteries, and we have a hot, uh, uh, hot swap uh, 
um, uh, technology uh, within our unit. So uh, that's usually not a problem for us. Uh, if there is a special emergency, you can always plug it to the car uh, as needed. But that, that was uh, not a challenge uh, so far. Okay. And uh, Michael, do you, do you, let's move up a, a little bit into the compression and the video quality. I think you know, that's a, a good topic to move to you on. The, uh, where, as codecs are evolving, uh, do you, have you found that you've had to uh, keep innovating within the platform to meet demands for technologies such as adaptive bit rate or smooth streaming or, or these new, this constant uh, evo evolution of the um, codec? Or are you finding it's more straightforward to have inside the system one particular codec and then to on the remote end of the link version the version and uh, if you like keep the uh, keep the versioning of the the the, um, the, uh, the treatment of the, the the video feed in the in the network rather than at the edge of the field no the um, our strategy there is that we uh, of course we need to keep that main codec which is provided by the hardware chip built in the box but you can do a lot around it. So there are technologies out there we can implement on the platform where, um, let's say, kind of intelligent store and forward has been done in the live streaming mode, where the, the bandwidth is detected and you can, let's say, dynamically increase kind of buffering inside the box itself or uh, a technology working by clocking and checking out whether packets are lost or not and then uh, dynamically adjusting the speed um, this is for us much more flexible on the hand to do that on the software side mm -hmm. than uh, touch, touch the sh chip side because this is something we are reliable uh, on what is being provided on the market in terms of hardware technology. And in the context, I think question for both of you guys, in, the con in that context, are you finding um, challenges with, uh, with, you know, with highly volatile networks? Are you, are you finding challenges with, with, uh, with uh, uh, forward error correction with uh, latency, with uh, you know these different network layer problems. You know that uh, presumably if you're uh, you're switching across lots of multiple um, uh, cellular networks, you're going to have to manage the latency in the platform to ensure that you don't constantly get break up in a picture every time you're jumping. Uh, are, these, are these challenges which are becoming more manageable? No, absolutely. You, you've just described a set of challenges that we face on a, on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we've developed um, a, against it. And uh, at this time, um, you know, in, in areas in which there is uh, decent coverage, we can provide it, you know, 1080 uh, HD quality with a latency of one second. But uh, it wasn't an obvious thing, you know, we had to uh, make uh, slow progress toward uh, that end. Um, with that, we do offer a set of other uh, settings. So uh, if the conditions are not that great, then we offer uh, a bit more of a buffering, and then you have to go to a three-second latency, and you still can keep a high uh, quality video. Mm -hmm. um, the, sometimes the issue is that uh, on big events, there are a lot of people using their original and uh, ordinary so smartphones, and they are hooked up to the cell all the time. So you never get a dedicated bandwidth. Think about five, 6,000 people are hooked up to one cell just for one provider. There's no chance even for him or for us with one technology to get in and get sufficient bandwidth. Maybe you agree. You can't do any load balancing where it's nothing. But with the passive area, it's oh, no, so uh, actually what we do is in that type of situation, then we leverage uh, all the other networks. So we have to be in a, you know, in a cellular crisis situation that no network is available for us not to be able to uh, take the uh, transmission out. So that's the load balancing. And then we have the antenna that allows us to hop over the congested area into the further away uh, tower in order to overcome that situation. But this is a fixed antenna. Um, well, our, the cellular is fixed antenna, but um, we, what we carry in our unit is a passive antenna that is smart enough to recognize the congestion and to go over to the next tower that is further away, and so to overcome the congestion. I mean, we, we are using this uh, daily. Actually, I uh, would be willing to bet a bet that all of you have seen this uh, at work because, uh, say, uh, transmission from events such as the Super Bowl or uh, the NBA uh, All-Star Game, all of them would have the conditions of having uh, 6,000 and more people with their smartphone, and yet people used successfully live view with these technologies to uh, take the transmission out. So we've got two destinations for this video. We've got direct to web 
and we've got to traditional broadcast. Okay, so they're kind of represented almost at each end of the table with uh, Hans and Andreas. So, um, a question for both of you. Uh, I'll put it to Hans first. Um, when is good good enough in terms of quality? Well, I think quality is not the issue nowadays when it comes to especially breaking news stuff. And, and YouTube done a tremendous job in, in helping us understanding that and, and coping with that. And, and, and like how we're facing it is like what we want to provide our users with and, and their viewers is, is this video that actually comes through. There is some kind of picture and some kind of or the voice is, uh, or the sound is prioritized uh, no matter how poor the connectivity is. That as long as you have a connectivity, we want to ensure you have a video that goes through and that has some latency of no more than one, one and a half seconds. So what we do is that we push it that our application can sense from at any given time how what the connectivity is and only push it through as many frames as possible. Uh, and what we do to compensate for that is that we all the drop frames, we, we store them on the handset and while you're done with your broadcast, we upload them and patch them back into the video. So what you get on demand, you watch you watch the full video as it would have been like with the with full connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so let, me, let me just. Let me, let me, let me just qual qual quality is not the issue, really. For I would say, for professional users, it can be an issue, uh, but as anything happens, something happens that they really want to capture live on video, quality is, is is less important, I would say. So Andreas, you know, from the uh, Thomson Reuters and from the Reuters point of view, I realize you wear two hats in this context. I think um, I wouldn't say. It depends pretty much on the content, right? So if you're talking news content, obviously the content is the key, it's not the quality. Um, Thomson Reuters as well, Reuters Media as well distributes entertainment, for example, and sports material. They obviously, quality is key, right? And um, so the expectation about quality actually um, depends on A, the context. So if you have self-publishing, Right, everybody is happy to have content from that region in the world in the first place, or if that content is unique, expectation of quality actually drops because that is the only source. If I if I put myself in the shoes of a publisher, so a client of ours buying content in the end, if I have 20 sources to choose from for the same event, or hopefully go for the ones with the highest quality on it, say a very good quality cost relation, because usually cost goes up with the with the quality. Um, and if I only have one source to pick from, I only have to check, okay, is that verse for me? Is the quality good enough for someone else who doesn't know the full background story to identify what the whole thing is about? Or am I able as a journalist to validate that that is genuine content in the first place? And that's something we never have to forget. Quality is an indication as well. Me as a third party, not having been there, being able to see is that genuine in the first place or is it just a mock-up, a fake or something like that? It's a completely different story. You don't have to touch on that one for any further, but that is a problem in the industry in the self-publishing market. And uh, sometimes quality helps me to identify uh, it is that place, it is that person, there is someone I can recognize in the video, and I find that content genuine. And I think that is something, in general, I would say it depends. Um, for news, quality isn't that much big of a problem, but you're completely right. If it's sports, no doubt. No one will, everybody would just a switch away, go to another channel if he's not happy with the sports but, coverage but that, that's kind of a given, I think, yeah. uh, that, that, that the kind of, of thing needs quality. But what, what, what's, what's interesting, I think, in, in terms of, of context is that we don't see our service as, 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 <coughs> as a substitute to, to existing service. It's a complement. And, and uh, just for example, during, during the uproars in, in Egypt and, and all those camera, those TV teams, they were based on balconies and hotels right around Tahrir Square. And like we had videos coming in, coming out from inside Tahrir Square, like 24/7, and and people were just coming to us, like, can we use that stuff? Can we use that material and publish it? And it, it was a New York Times, BBC, mm -hmm. Al Jazeera, Sky, you name it. Uh, so in that perspective, I totally agree with you that it it's, comes into context what kind of, of stuff it is. So Ariel, as you've been selling Live View into the news agencies um, over the years, have you found that um, maybe the concept of quality has changed? You know, the, uh, yes, um, I, I agree, and I think that um, as uh, media continue to splinters, 
you know, people expectation for quality ha has changed a bit. And so uh, some of the largest uh, news agencies would, would tell us, all right, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the story trumps the picture, but then they will add, this is assuming that others don't have a better picture. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, uh, yes, the environment has changed and uh, they're willing to take a lower uh, quality. Some would tell us, all right, if it is an extreme uh, situation that we were describing before, then just get us a picture and make sure the voice will, will get through. But this is in, in more uh, related to, uh, again, like we were saying before, for breaking news, not for um, sports or other type of content. So does this pre present a change for the broadcaster? If everybody's used to tuning into Sky News, I'll pick them at random. If everyone's choosing, choosing to tune into Sky News and the quality of picture that they're seeing on every news bulletin is the same as the quality of picture that they may be seeing on a web service, and I'm not saying that it's automatically a lower quality picture, but generally there may be an association that it is. Do you think that this may mean that the quality of the, the, the image um, is going to be less of a driver for people to go and tune into Sky News and they may just turn away from the traditional broadcast media to the web? Hence, uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't think that that's going to do the change or do uh, make, any, make any changes. What I think, though, is important to understand here, uh, what I think is about or about to happen, we're seeing it happen, is, is, is how you can crowdsource content as, as like, what is 100,000 people around Tahrir Square probably going to get more interesting picture out of that place than five camera teams teams on balconies in hotels around, around that square. And that's how I think that, that the media companies at the large are going to have to rethink how they're actually working. Because they, they most often are going to be far away from where the action actually is. And there's going to be people more and more. It's going to happen at a larger and larger extent going forward. People are at the scene as it happens. And how do you, how do you get hold of them? And how do you contract them in some way? Uh, and that's going to be an issue thing going forward, I think, in order to, to, to ensure that you, as a media agency or a media platform, has that content that really matters at the time it happens. And so this touches on something. I, I had a conversation with Lipa, who was going to be on this panel, and, and isn't he? he had a conversation uh, last week just in preparation for today. Um, and he was, uh, he was talking about curation. And uh, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times in presentations today. I think curation is going to be a very significant part of... Uh, the landscape over the next uh, in the streaming space over the next 24 months. I think um, you know we can all go and watch hit, hit YouTube and try and find something interesting. We can all go and hit a, any other what was a user generated content site maybe as an I don't know they're changing names all the time. But uh, what's actually interesting maybe what the brands maybe what Reuters maybe what Sky News bring to it is that editorial filter. So do you, do you, do you have that filtration process on, on Bambi? Yes, we do in, in quite a few instances as well from. from Anything that way you can you position it. Uh, you can actually, as, as you can do with bamboos, you can interact with the person who's broadcasting through the application, uh, through text-based chat. Uh, we have a map, so so you can you can locate videos from anywhere in the world geographically. Uh, that happens right now, what has happened in the past hours or the past 24 hours or whatever. So we started working on that curation, and and, and I think that's going to be an important part going forward as well. And so, um, jumping to the other side of the table, and I will keep coming back to the technology in the middle, don't worry, but jumping to the other side of the table, do you, um, Andreas, from the point of view of Reuters as the news agency, uh, do, you, uh, do you see that that's going to be something you'll embrace, or do you think, see that's something that's a challenge? Because now curation the Curation in particular, is, or the sorry? curation in particular, or uh, more the self-publishing? Cur well, cura in theory, when uh, the news agencies are buying Sorry, the, the news channels are buying media from Reuters as a news agency. They're relying on you to do a degree of curation. Um, but you've got it almost instinctively got, or naturally got a, uh, an editorial control because it's traditionally been your own guys who are trained in producing media. And now or at we've least trusted sources. Trusted That's sources. But now, now we've got Joe Public with an iPhone interviewing someone who's been shot and or whatever, that's a terrible example, but you know, um, we, we've got, we, we, you know, do, do you see this as a, uh, a challenge or an opportunity? I would say it's an opportunity, and not really for us as a via service or a news agency, it's opportunity for the whole industry, and um, because, and if I put that in context, it's 
the mobile revolution on its own, the increased usage of uh, or consumption of news on the go, and especially the use of people to actually judge uh, personal or crowd-created content versus actually cleansed text in uh, uh, tagged and indexed content. And that's the reason why it's, uh, it's an opportunity because it actually means for us as a professional services provider, the overall increase of everybody's content is going to be higher. And that actually means as well, in the bottom line, our context, our content in context with crowdsourced content will be increased. Okay, so let's 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 come back uh, back over to technology, um, Michael. We, we we're seeing uh, increasingly technologies like uh, you know the iPhone. I think uh, one one CDN at the Content Delivery Summit yesterday was talking about how the iPhone represents only nine percent of their user base for their mobile sector, but it represents sixty percent of their traffic. So, mobile devices certainly as a receiving device have really come of age. Um, with applications like Vanvisa, Ustream, uh, Livestream, and so on, they're, they're, we're increasingly seeing small portable devices, Minicaster, maybe uh, there may be a parallel here, uh, able to produce higher and higher quality content. Um, at what point will the uh, iPhone 10, whatever it may be, uh, replace the uh, news crew? Uh, you know, I'm going to ask this to both both of the people in the middle here. Um, but M Michael, do you think that the technology you're producing in Minicaster uh, is going to gradually become embedded in in the phone? Still, you need still you need uh, somebody operating that device, whatever it is. So um, you need journalists. I think you need people to judge what kind of content is that. On one end, where you capture it; on the other end, where you receive it, and then maybe publish it. If we're talking about a broad publishing, and not about everyday Joe just setting up a stream and nobody cares about. So even uh, at the Egypt uh, thing, it was very hard to determine what kind of content is that, how old is that? And the German, uh, the German TV station always said, we just received some, some video, but we can't really testify kind of what kind of is it. It's an imagination of something, but you know. And this, um, you need still, uh, you need uh, still people uh, to to do so. But over the years, maybe this will change as well. So the role of people operating with kind of devices will maybe change as well. But you need still the judgment. iPhone 10, whatever it will be, um, is maybe uh, ultra high def, whatever streaming everywhere device. But uh, as we learned, it's not only the device itself. We need that connectivity. Uh, maybe 4G will help us there to be wireless. There will be more satellite technologies coming up with higher uplink capacity in the near future. Um, I think this is one, uh, one major issue as well, not only the capturing and sending device, then we need a whole infrastructure to be improved. And yeah, you never, we never have imagined. I, I remember two, uh, 1999, I think it was the first live video from a Korean or Israeli um, company on, on, uh, in Cannes on the 3GM World Congress, the former big fair, and they showed uh, video streaming on 28K. So everybody was really surprised, but they said, okay, shaky pictures. But in the near future, of course, uh, there will be some tremendous changes. And now, you know, you're in, in the Live View unit, you uh, combine two parts of the workflow. You combine it, combine encoding, you also combine it with transmission. Uh, and you had a JVC camera, was it, where you've integrated the, yes. uh, the transmission inside the camera. You know, is this going to become the norm? Um, yeah, was I, I supposed to mention that? I'm sorry? <laughs> was I not supposed to mention that? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, it was in our booth in IBC, so uh, uh, many people have seen it. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, in the last few years we've seen how phones becoming cameras. Uh, what we did not see yet is how um, professional cameras are becoming uh, phones or video phone, better said. So I think uh, it, it is an opportunity for uh, many of the uh, professional uh, camera providers to, to take that direction, uh, not only because it is a natural uh, evolution uh, of, of the camera and there is a need for that out there in the field, uh, but also because there is a very interesting opportunity for, for them to change the, uh, the way they are uh, engaging with their clients. 
So uh, the typical engagement now, uh, in, from their perspective, would be that you sell a camera for, uh, say, $10,000 or $50,000, sometimes more, and, and, and that's it. That's the end of the engagement. But when you transform that uh, combined phone camera into uh, a, a full service, now you have a continuous relationship with, with their users. Uh, they can, so to speak, get more in the vein of the customer, provide additional service like uh, archiving of videos on, on their um, uh, on some servers or allow you to stream it immediately uh, and potentially price the camera in a completely different way. Say you do a subscription into a JVC and you pay for it over several years and when a new camera and a new transmission technology is available, you're basically being replaced and you, you keep yourself updated that way. So there is a far reach implication for the um, uh, manufacturers of uh, video equipment uh, taking that direction. And so let's, let's uh, have a look a little, a little bit wider now. Let's look at the technologies and what can be done. Let's look at the, um, the uh, operational requirements. Of, uh, we, we, we were talking at lunch about uh, crowdsourcing your videographers, you know, that this idea of, um, in a coordinated way, being able to find somebody who's near an event. Uh, there's a, a, an interesting statistic. Nearly every news story now is broken on Twitter. In, in, in almost universally, every news story breaks on Twitter. Then the camera phones start uploading clips and live streams through services like Vanvisa. Then the live view guys get on site because they're highly mobile compared with the OB trucks. Some hours later, the OB trucks turn up and report what was two hours ago news. And so, you know, we've, 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 we've seen a, a, a complete operational change in how news is sourced and how news is, is gathered. Um, Again, you know, looking at the two poles of Van Buza and, uh, and Reuters, maybe they're not poles, maybe they're parallels, but uh, looking at these two different examples, um, the operational uh, job of, of filtering the content, of trying to add editorial, of trying to manage the influx of uh, a huge quantity of new forms of data, how do we extract the reality? How do we extract the, the news from the, uh, the, 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 the rubbish? Well, it's at some, in some ways we're self-filtering, I would say, because what's really news immediately gets distributed, especially through Twitter, as you mentioned. mentioned and, and, and when it starts being distributed there, you, you know for sure that there's something in it. Uh, or most, most often it is. I would say 95% of the cases it is. So tw Twitter is, is an, a phenomenal tool, I would say, to, to actually figure out what's newsworthy and what's not, and what, what really matters to people and what kind of information it is and what kind of content it is. And do you think that that editorial process will remain human, or do you think we're going to see advances in technology which can start to we automatically We certainly filter? will see advances in, in, in technology. That I, I do hope it's going to be some kind of human involvement going forward for an eternity, but, but definitely going to be software that fills that in. in so I was going through my mind last week I was at um, the Wired conference and they, uh, there was a company, an Israeli company called Face.com, a really unusual take on face recognition because they're centralizing the face recognition in, a, in one database. So whoever their clients are using their API, once they've logged your, logged your face, any of their other clients can use that for, for recognition. Are there, I mean, do you see that as a technology which could be integrated in these workflows? Do you think that... Uh, the, are there other technologies that I haven't seen that, that, that maybe you're using? Maybe, Andreas, you, you've seen technologies in, inside Reuters which uh, are, are doing I think the, the bottom line question is, um, well, I would suggest to pull back the lens, right, saying um, automation is key in every process. And it, the demand for any automation is there because if you look at news gathering 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you were talking about five to eight people on the side producer, makeup, journalist, cameraman, satellite uplink, you name it. And over the last 15 years, we're currently down to two people. And uh, if we can do the next step, going to one, news agencies and um, TV channels will jump on it. it I, well, we don't care how you do it. If it's a mobile phone being a camera, a camera being a mobile phone, we demand the next step is going down from two people to one. It's interesting, um, someone told me today that the, uh, apparently the BBC are now using internally the term predators for program editor directors. Exactly, it's exactly what I'm talking about. So we have seen an industry from 
eight highly specialized people going down to one person. And I wouldn't be surprised that in 15 years that person even doesn't exist anymore and we have something like a program to have a trusted source, trusted source program where we are seeing, okay, we've got the combination of several people we used to work with, as a, not as a news agency, but probably as a TV channel, then you can see, okay, it even gets, could that one person I could eliminate in the long run. And every technology helping news channels, newspapers, you name it, getting closer to that one is what they want to. I don't want to comment anything on quality and um, gener generity on that content, but in the end that is the market trend over the last 15, 20 years. And if you just look isolated in on technology today, I think you miss that important thing that you want to get down to one person and in the long run probably down to zero person we have to pay for. Um, but I, I think big events still need bigger crews than one. It's impossible to do everything and you need more than two eyes to cover a story. It's I, I completely agree. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about for a Premier League soccer, of course, and there's enough money there to finance properly 20 cameras around the field with 20 cameramen, the producers, are probably talking a team 30, 50 people here. But the normal news gallery, um, so breaking news, something like that, which isn't pre-planned, so nothing where we have to schedule with the president or something like that, but really something happens, you turn up there, it will go down to one person and probably even less than that. Of course, but if you're on air as a one single team, you miss the news coming up, uh, let's say, with a development. So you're on air and something new happening, you miss that part. And there's a second time you go on air and a third time and maybe tenth time. So I don't think that will work. Uh, in some cases, the one cameraman, video journalist, your, whatever you name it, can do it. But then again, that depends really on the story. Because usually you need a journalist, a reporter, everything. Need to, uh, you need to, um, you, you shoot footage and so on. You need to edit that. You need to um, make a voiceover. You need to write something. And uh, of course, the one in one 90 seconds stand up, or whatever is possible. But is that really what, what people are uh, expecting? I think the more content we get, the more people will enjoy that there will be some guidance through journalistic work. And the other stuff, let's say, the, the long tail, this is fine enough, 50 people watching, 500 people watching, the fifth league, whatever, junior soccer from Halifax, whatever, this is fine. But in the, in the, in the professional media, of course, they like to uh, bring down costs in terms of technology, which is, let's say, obvious. But I, I stress the fact that uh, you need, again, experienced people, experts, to do the stuff. So one of the, one of the things that I think has changed in news over, that uh, I started by mentioning one of my fascinations with getting into streaming, into webcasting, was it, I felt it democratized broadcasting. It's allowed everyone to do that. Is there a point where the industry needs to take a corporate social responsibility for this? You know, are we, are, Ariel, are you going to sell a live U unit to some complete nutcase who comes into your facility and wants to buy one and wants to broadcast some crazy ideology, are you actually going to take, take a decision not to sell them at any point or are you going to be a business and say, it's a customer who's paying? Well, uh, I don't know that it is up to us to decide uh, who is the nutcase or not because uh, you know, it could be a nutcase from my perspective but it could be making lots of sense to uh, obviously somebody else. So uh, I, I don't know that... Um, you know, it is. Our, I mean, the same. The same goes, I guess, for uh, any uh, cellular phone or any other piece of technology, or any other mean by which you can, you know, deliver your message. And um, you know, it, it, it has to be at the end of the day up to the market to decide whether they buy that ideology or not. Um, you know, it's. it's uh, it cannot be up to, I believe, any of us to decide uh, who, who would get the uh, the technology or not. Now, Hans, is that the same for you? Because presumably, if somebody starts filming some horrific abuse of a child, you, you're into a very, very dangerous water with publishing uh, and, and the legality of that. Yeah, and that's, that's a fact, and, and, and um, we're well, very well aware of that. Uh, and there are two things that comes in there, there, there or three things, really. There, there is not yet any software that can detect anything of abuse or sexual content or anything like that. Uh, secondly, is that we're monitoring, we're trying to monitor every single video that comes in manually. Uh, through our own resources and through, through external resources. 
And, and the third thing that is very good with, with today's, today's web, it's very, very self-filtering. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people who adopt the service, they really want that service to be what they like, want it to be. And they're really quick in reporting anything they see that shouldn't be there, if it's abuse, if it's copyrighted content or wherever it can be. So, so those are the parameters to play with today. And, and, and uh, with, with, with live video, there is this element of, of, of thing that can happen, that you don't want to happen. <coughs> And we've been fortunate so far, uh, some others haven't, uh, and we're probably going to see more things going forward that are unpleasant uh, for anyone really. But, but I hope that that's where I hope technology is going to play in going forward, being able to detect what, what should be there, what should And it brings us to you, the theme of your marketing at the moment, the, rebe the, the live streaming rebellion, is it the uh, mark of the live streaming? You know, this, is, uh, this is exactly what I think we're seeing. We're seeing uh, media democratized to the nth order now. The, 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 there's, no, uh, there's no fixed control over what we see. Um, we could be led to believe everything we see. Uh, I would have a question what happened or what, should, what would happen if, if the assassination in Norway would be broadcasted over your service? Have you, have you talked about it in your team? Because that was yeah, Scandinavia. We, and think, imagine about that situation that you have 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, people be killed in real time in real life and nobody's really uh, capable to switch off that stream. This is some, some day this will happen, so we have to be prepared for that. There will be some day when this is going to be happen for the first we, time. We, we had this case in Sweden just a few months ago, uh, not using bamboos, but the person who, who would kill himself by hanging and streamed it live. And, and I, I know there have been quite a few such cases around the world. It's, it's just terrible. And, and, and we, we've talked so much about it and, and, and we're doing like everything we possibly can. And we're being so, we, 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 we're like really hitting down on anything we see that shouldn't be there. And we, we're exceptionally uh, uh, hard on that. And, and we're emailing people who, who put up content that shouldn't be there. So we're taking all the precautions we can to, in, in order just to get the word out that we're a service that immediately hits down on anything, anything that's copyrighted or abused or whatever it could be. Uh, so it, from that perspective, I think we, we come out so far pretty well on this, but we always know that there is a risk that something can happen and that, that we might miss and that we can't control. So we're now seeing more, uh, you know, I often explain to my kid, the, um, the, uh, it looks like there's more and more bad things happening. Maybe there's not, maybe we're just seeing more bad things happening. It's a, a subtle thing of perception. So one, one last question to put to you guys, and then I'm going to see if there's any questions on the floor, and then we can all rush off to have some free beer. Um, so uh, the, uh, again, at the WIRED conference, there was a, one of my favorite slides that one of the presenters brought up was a, a picture of David Cameron and, uh, and a picture of Colonel Gaddafi, both of them sharing one speech bubble, saying, turn the networks off. OK, so. Uh, this is something that's, you know, it's quite topical here. We've had that as a, a political issue during riots. Uh, the um, the uh, instinct has been, oh, no, people are out there with live view using the cellular networks. People have got minicasters and are using broadband networks and they're getting it to Bambuza and rice is a heightening profile of this and this is bad. Quick, shut it off. But we don't want people to know we're having riots. It's, it's just going to breed problems. Should your technology be able to circumnavigate that? Or should you be sitting there going, OK, well, we have to live in a governed state and uh, we have to put up with uh, these external forces? Oh, God. Let's start with that, Andreas. <laughs> oh, it's a loaded question from my point of view. Um, so from a personal, personal experience, my personal opinion is the grey area is always one country's terrorist is another country's hero. Um, so um, that is always problem in use you're actually dealing with and um, as a company you always follow local rules and regulations that's just what you have to do um, that's one of those things uh, a lot of agencies has been kicked out of those countries as well um, because we now we try to do the job right which is news gathering and because everybody knows we are a news agency that's the reason why they're kicking out um, so by intention um, that's one part of the problem. The other part is, um, obviously, well, information will find its way. That's another bottom line truth. Um, so we had people in the 70s and 80s smuggling film rolls out of countries. 
right? In the meantime, it's not any more film reel smuggling or film smuggling. It's pretty much trying to find ways of information, you know, as if it's a telephone, analog telephone, an old modem, if it's broadband or whatsoever. So information and life will find its way in one or the other way. If the people have the feeling it's information um, to take a personal risk for, and especially if we're talking about filters. If I have, if I get the feeling as a news agency or even as a broadcaster, a newspaper, there are people taking personal risks to give me that information that is already a good indication um, that that is an information that is worthwhile being published. And, and all those technologies we are talking about, if they are used by people under, under that circumstance, uh, it's the circumstance itself uh, that is indicating, and the people, people always will try to find a way, never it's China or if it's during those countries have gone through the Arabic Spring. Um, I think that is exactly the point altogether. So it's not the technology itself, it's always the human using the technology that actually makes the difference. I don't know if that's really a direct answer to your question, but. It's, it's a very broad question. Okay. <laughs> it's an answer how you wish. Let's go across the table, Mike. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree. You agree. So, no big difference. Um, I, I, I think it is the reporter's decision to assume, uh, to, to take the dangerous assumption. Will I transmit uh, when Gaddafi is telling me not to? Um, you know, from experience with our unit, our unit were used in, in Egypt. Some of them were lost for the Egyptian police. Um, others were lost in uh, drug wars in Latin America. Uh, so, so the reporters that we've been serving uh, find themselves in uh, sometimes uh, very tough situations, and, and some make decisions to still uh, try to get the picture out. And uh, they're, it's, unfortunately, some of them paid uh, dearly for that. Yeah. Well, I say, where, where things happen that matters to people who are there, they're going to do anything they can to get the pictures out. And, and uh, we, we saw that we saw that very much in Egypt. We've seen it by Ryan in Syria and Jordan, uh, Libya. Uh, and it's kind of interesting how people do it, and, and it's, it's fairly simple just to switch the GPS off your phone, and, and in, a, in a fairly crowded place, walking around with a phone, that no one's going to take notice to you, think you're broadcasting, and you're broadcasting to the whole world, but if they can't identify you if you have an account where you're not yourself on Bamboos or whatever service it is. And we see, we're also seeing these guys in Syria now, uh, who are constantly broadcasting every evening from Syria, set up their own network. They're fearing for their lives without me chatting to them. And, and just to get the pictures out of people chanting and dancing in the streets, uh, and trying to show that there is a positive atmosphere within Syria and it's not just killing. And it's like really touching pictures that mm. are coming out. And, and, and they don't want to give out their names. They, they switch everything off. They, they, they register themselves as being from Australia or Azerbaijan or Austria or whatever, doing anything, but they really want to do it. So if there is something that matters to, to human beings, it's going to do anything to get that, that, that out, no matter if it's text, picture, or video. So I'm just going to close with a comment. The, uh, the guy who had that slide at the Wired Conference was the, um, formerly the chief of police for New York. And uh, he, he'd been actually over in the country both for the conference, but also to advise, uh, advise the UK government on their strategy. They've been making announcements about whether they should have shut off the BlackBerry networks and so on during the uh, recent riots. And he firmly advised against it. I just think make this point for interest because um, he'd been in, uh, involved, closely involved in, in the September the 11th uh, collapses and the cellular networks were largely knocked out. They weren't purposefully turned off but they were largely knocked out and that radio blackout uh, across New York caused more widespread panic because people couldn't get in touch with each other. And I think that's at the essence of this. I think uh, uh, you know, his advice was uh, firmly do not turn the networks off, let the media get through. Okay, so um, we have got a few minutes if there are any questions from the floor. Uh, I don't want to hold anyone up from uh, rushing off to the beer. I'll certainly be first to the bar. But before we get there, are there any questions? Everyone wants a beer. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you more tomorrow. And uh, well, thanks. <laughs>